Hi everyone, it's Professor Primton, and today we're going to finish up our discussion on real zeros of polynomials. So in the previous video, we talked about how to use rational zeros theorem to find the rational zeros of a polynomial function, and we also use the rational zeros of a polynomial function to help us find out the real zeros of the polynomial function to write the function in its factored form. In this video, we're going to use what's called Descartes' rule signs to determine the number of positive and negative real zeros of a polynomial function, and again, also to find the real zeros of a polynomial function to write the function in its factored form. So let's talk about Descartes' rule of signs. So in some cases, the following rule, discovered by French mathematician and philosopher René Descartes in 1637, is actually helpful to eliminate some of the candidates that we have from the potential rational zero from the rational zeros theorem. To describe the rule, we need the concept of variation in sign. So if p of x is a polynomial function with real coefficients, not necessarily integer coefficients, but this time real coefficients, where you have the polynomial function written in descending order of powers of x, then a variation in the sign occurs when two adjacent coefficients have opposite signs. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have the polynomial function capital P of x is 5x to the 7th, subtract 3x to the 5th, subtract x to the 4th, plus 2x squared plus x minus 3. Notice that this polynomial function is written in descending order of degree. The highest power of x is first the next highest power, the third highest power, and so on, all the way down to the constant term, if there is one. We want to find out if you have two adjacent terms, two terms side by side or next to one another, is there a change in the sign of the coefficients? So we go from positive 5x to the 7th to negative 3x to the 5th. And we went from coefficient of 5 to a coefficient of negative 3. And these two terms are adjacent to one another. That is a sign variation. It went from positive 5 to negative 3. Then the next two adjacent terms are negative 3x to the 5th and negative x to the 4th. Well, we went from negative 3 coefficient to a negative 1 coefficient. That's not a sign variation. So let's go to the next two adjacent terms. You have negative x to the 4th and positive 2x squared. You went from negative 1 coefficient to positive 2 coefficient. So that is a sign variation. Then from 2x squared to 1x, that went from positive 2 coefficient to a positive 1 coefficient. No sign variation. But then the last two terms, the last two adjacent terms, 1x and subtract 3, you have positive 1 as the coefficient in front of the x, and you have a negative 3 as the constant term. That's a sign variation. Two adjacent terms have opposite signs for their coefficients. And so if you count up the sign variations, there are three sign variations for the polynomial function p of x. And notice that you can ignore any missing terms. We had x to the seventh missing, and also an x cubed missing, you don't need to worry about those. You only need to worry about two terms that are side by side or adjacent when you're comparing the coefficients, whether they're positive to negative or may it change from negative to positive. So how do we use this idea about variations in sign to help us find out information about the real zeros of a polynomial function? Well, this theorem is called Descartes' rule of signs. Let P of X, capital P of X, be a polynomial function with real number coefficients. Number one, the number of positive real zeros of the polynomial function p of x is either equal to the number of variations in sine of p of x or is less than that by an even whole number. And then number two says the number of negative real zeros of p of x, the same polynomial function, either is equal to the number of sign variations of p of negative x, so this is where you take the polynomial function and you replace all the x's with the negative x, or it's less than that by an even whole number. So to understand Descartes' rule of signs, let's look at example three. Example three, using Descartes' rule of signs. So using Descartes' rule of signs, determine the possible number of positive real zeros, which is statement number one, and the number of negative real zeros, which is statement number two, for each of the following polynomial functions. So let's look at it number one. f of x is this polynomial function, 2x cubed minus 5x squared minus 8x plus 11. Make sure that the polynomial function is written in descending order of power, or powers of x, so the highest power of x is first, the next highest power, and so on, all the way down to the lowest power of x as the term on the far right. So this is in decent in order. So now you can actually look at adjacent terms and find out, is there a sign variation between two coefficients between positive and negative or vice versa? So you have positive 2x cubed and then negative 5x squared. That's a sign variation. You went from positive 2 coefficient to a negative 5 coefficient between two adjacent terms or two terms side by side. Then you go from negative 5x squared to negative 8x. Well, that went from a coefficient of negative 5 to a coefficient of negative 8. No sign variation. But then you went from negative 8x 
to positive 11, it went from coefficient of negative 8 to a coefficient of positive 11. That's a sign variation. So it looks like you have two sign variations for the polynomial function f of x. That tells you information about how many positive real zeros are possible for the polynomial function p of x. So in this case, f of x will have either two positive real zeros or an even number less than two. Well, if you have two as a possibility, you also have zero as a possibility because zero is two less than two. So two or zero positive real zeros are possible for this polynomial function f of x. Now statement number two is talking about negative real zeros. It says you need to find out what is the polynomial function evaluated at negative x. So let's do that. Let's take f and replace all the x's with a negative x as your input value. So f of negative x, you take all the x's and replace them with the negative x in parentheses. So you have two times negative x in parentheses cubed minus five times x is replaced with a negative x in parentheses, and that's being squared, minus 8 times x, but that's negative 8 times negative x now, plus 11. Now you need to simplify because you want to find out what's the sign of your coefficients for each term. So f of negative x is negative 2x cubed minus 5x squared, after you simplify, plus 8x plus 11. Well now let's look for any sign variations between two adjacent terms. You went from negative 2x cubed to negative 5x squared. No sign change or sign variation. But then the next one is negative 5x squared and positive 8x. Those coefficient went from negative 5 to positive 8. That's a sign variation. And then you went from 8x to 11. That is positive 8 coefficient to a positive 11 coefficient. No sign variation. So if you count out how many sign changes or sign variations you have, there was only one. So what that means with statement number two is that the polynomial function f of x will have one negative real zero. Let's try another one. Number two, let's look at this polynomial function. g of x is equal to 3x to the sixth plus 4x to the fifth plus 3x cubed minus x minus 3. So if you look at the original polynomial function g of x, you can find out how many positive real zeros are possible if you look at the sign variations. So you went from 3x to the sixth to 4x to the fifth, and there's no sign variation. You went from positive 3 coefficient to positive 4 coefficient. You can ignore any missing term, so ignore 0x to the fourth. So now 4x to the fifth, the next adjacent term is 3x cubed. So it went from positive 4 coefficient to positive 3 coefficient, no sign variation. Then you went from 3x cubed, ignore 0x squared, that's the missing term, ignore it. But you went from positive 3x cubed to a minus 1x. That went from positive 3 coefficient to a negative 1 coefficient. That's a sign variation. And then the last two terms, you went from negative 1x to a negative 3, no sign change, no sign variation. So the total number of sign variations was 1. So since this was the original polynomial function, g of x, that means you have one positive real zero. Now on the other hand, if you want to find out how many negative real zeros you have, you need to find out what is the polynomial function when you replace all the x's with a negative x. You need to find g of negative x. So let's do that. Let's take all the x's and replace them with a negative x in parentheses. You have 3 times negative x in parentheses to the 6th, plus 4 times negative x in parentheses to the 5th. You can ignore the missing term. You have 3 times negative x in parentheses cubed. And then again, ignore the missing term, 0x squared. Minus x becomes minus the opposite of x. And then minus 3 stays minus 3. So if you simplify all the coefficients, g of negative x will simplify to 3x to the 6th, minus 4x to the 5th, ignore the 0x to the 4th, minus 3x cubed, ignore 0x squared plus x minus 3. So let's find out how many sign variations do you have in the coefficients of two adjacent terms. You went from 3x to the 6th to negative 4x to the 5th. So positive 3 coefficient to a negative 4 coefficient. That's a sign variation. Negative 4x to the 5th, the next adjacent term is negative 3x cubed. So we went from negative 4 to negative 3 coefficient, so no sign variation. But then negative 3x cubed went to positive x. Ignore the missing term again. So it went from negative 3 coefficient to a positive 1 coefficient. That's a sign variation. And then the last two terms, positive 1x and minus 3. That's a sign variation. You went from positive 1 coefficient to a negative 3. So it looks like you have three sign variations for g of negative x. Well, that tells you how many negative real zeros are possible for the function g of x. So you'll have three or an even number less than three. So you have three and then two less than three is one. So you can either have three or one negative real zeros for the polynomial function g of x.
So let's look at example four. Example four is factoring a polynomial function. Find the real zeros of the polynomial function f of x is equal to x to the fifth minus 5x to the fourth plus 12x cubed subtract 24x squared plus 32x minus 16 using the following steps to write the function in its factored form. So this time we have a function that's already written in descending order for us and the highest power of x that we see is 5. So we're going to factor this polynomial function by identifying what are the real zeros of that polynomial function. So number one, use the degree of the polynomial to determine the maximum number of real zeros. Well, since the degree of this polynomial function is 5, the degree of the polynomial function is 5, that means you can have at most 5 real zeros. So the number of real zeros you can have is at most the same as the degree of the polynomial function. Number 2, let's use Descartes' rule of signs that we just learned to determine the possible number of positive real zeros and also the number of possible negative real zeros of the polynomial function f of x. So let's look for any sign variations in the original polynomial f of x first. That will tell us whether we have any possible positive real zeros. So f of x is equal to x to the fifth minus 5x to the fourth plus 12x cubed minus 24x squared plus 32x minus 16. Let's find out how many sign variations we have. We went from 1x to the fifth to negative 5x to the fourth. That's a sign change or a sign variation. Went from positive 1 coefficient to a negative 5 coefficient between two adjacent terms. Then it went from negative 5x to the fourth to 12x cubed. That's a sign variation because it went from negative 5 coefficient to a coefficient of positive 12. Then 12x cubed to negative 24x squared. There again is a sign variation from positive 12 coefficient to negative 24 coefficient. Then the negative 24 coefficient on x squared to 32x. Well, that went from negative 24 coefficient to a positive 32 coefficient. So another sign variation. And then the last two terms, there's a sign variation as well. It went from positive 32 coefficient to negative 16 coefficient. So if you add up all the sign changes you have, you have one, two, three, four, five sign variations in the function f of x between two any adjacent terms. So that means you can either have five positive real zeros or an even number less than five. So an even number less than five would be two less than five. So three is a possibility for positive real zeros or an even number less than three. So two less than three is one. So one positive real zero is also a possibility. So you can either have five or three or one positive real zero for this function f of x using Descartes' rule sign. Now, if we want to find out how many possible negative real zeros of the polynomial function we have, we need to find out what is f of negative x. So take all the x's in your polynomial function and replace them with a negative x in parentheses. So you'll have negative x in parentheses to the fifth, minus 5 times that x is replaced with a negative x in parentheses to the fourth, plus 12 times negative x in parentheses cubed, minus 24 in parentheses negative x squared, plus 32 times negative x minus 16. Now simplify all the coefficients so you can figure out how many sign variations you have. f of negative x will simplify to be negative x to the fifth, minus 5x to the fourth, minus 12x cubed, minus 24x squared, minus 32x, minus 16. Notice between any two adjacent terms, there is no sign variation between the coefficients. We went from a negative 1 coefficient to a negative 5 coefficient, to a negative 12 coefficient, to a negative 24, to a negative 32, and then negative 16. There is no sign variations between any two adjacent terms. So no sign variations means, with Descartes' rule signs, there will be zero negative real zeros possible for this polynomial function f of x. And now number three. If the polynomial function has integer coefficients, Use the rational zeros theorem to identify any potential rational zeros, just like we did in the previous video. So the rational zeros theorem said this. All your zeros, rational zeros, will be of the form p divided by q, where p is the numerator, it must be factors of the constant term, and q is the denominator, it must be factors of the leading coefficient of your polynomial function. So let's look at the factors of the constant term. So factors of the constant term, the constant term was negative 16. So what are all the numbers that go into negative 16 evenly without a remainder? Well, you can have plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 8, and plus or minus 16. Those are the only numbers that will go into negative 16 evenly. And now factors of the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient was 1. It was 1x to the fifth. So what are all the numbers that go into 1 evenly? Well, it's plus or minus 1. So now we can list all the possible rational zeros for this polynomial function f of x. Well, we can have plus or minus 1 divided by plus or minus 1. That's plus or minus 1. Plus or minus 2 divided by plus or minus 1 is plus or minus 2. Same thing with plus or minus 4 divided by plus or minus 1 is plus or minus 4. 
plus or minus 8 divided by plus or minus 1 is plus or minus 8. And plus or minus 16 divided by plus or minus 1 is plus or minus 16. So from this list, it looks like we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 possible rational zeros. Well, here's where Descartes' rule of signs actually helps us. From our previous step, we found out that there were zero negative real zeros. So we can ignore all the negative values for possible rational zeros. So our possible rational zeros are either positive 1, positive 2, positive 4, positive 8, and positive 16, because we know that we'll have zero negative real zeros possible. And now number four, use either polynomial or synthetic division and also the factor theorem to determine if each potential rational zero is a real zero of the polynomial function. Well, we only have five possible rational zeros to check. We have 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16. So let's start off by using the remainder and factor theorems to find out, is 1 a real zero of this polynomial function? So we know how we can check this. If you substitute 1 into your polynomial function and you get 0, that means the remainder is 0. And that means that you have found a factor of that polynomial function. So if you substitute 1 into your polynomial function f of x, you have 1 to the 5th minus 5 times 1 to the 4th plus 12 times 1 cubed minus 24 times 1 squared plus 32 times 1 minus 16. If you evaluate this output value, you will get 0. And so that means the remainder is 0 whenever you take the polynomial function f of x and divide by x minus 1 because we substituted 1 into the polynomial function. And so now, since we know a factor is x minus 1 of f of x, we can use synthetic division to find out what is the quotient polynomial times x minus 1 that gives us f of x. So all the coefficients of f of x go on the inside of the division bar. 1x to the fifth, so 1, negative 5, 12, negative 24, 32, and negative 16 are the coefficients of f of x. 1 goes on the outside because we know that 1 is a real 0 of the polynomial function. So now remember how synthetic division works. You drop down the leading coefficient 1, and now you multiply. 1 times 1 gives you 1, so 1 goes underneath the negative 5. So now you add vertically. Negative 5 plus 1 gives you negative 4. And now repeat. 1 times negative 4 gives you negative 4, so negative 4 goes underneath the 12. Now add. 12 plus negative 4 gives you 8. Now again, multiply. 1 times 8 will give you 8. 8 goes underneath the negative 24, and now you add again. Negative 24 plus 8 gives you negative 16. 1 times negative 16 gives you negative 16, and then 32 plus negative 16 is positive 16. 1 times 16 is 16, and then that last column is negative 16 plus 16, which will give you 0. So the remainder, after you divide by x minus 1 with the polynomial f of x, the remainder is 0. Well, we knew that because if we plugged in 1 into the polynomial function, we got 0. So we already knew that x minus 1 was a factor. We want the quotient polynomial after we divide by x minus 1. So the 16 is the constant term. Negative 16 is the x coefficient. 8 is the x squared coefficient. Negative 4 is the x cubed coefficient. And the 1 is the x to the fourth coefficient. So right now we know that f of x will factor as this. x minus 1, we already knew, was a factor times the quotient polynomial x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 8x squared minus 16x plus 16. So if you take these two factors and multiply out, you will get f of x. So we know that x minus 1 is a factor, and then we have this other polynomial function that we want to continue factoring. So we know that x equals 1 is a real 0. What are the real zeros of this quotient polynomial, which is the next step? So number 5, repeat the previous step until you reach a quotient polynomial that is either a quadratic polynomial and factors, or use the quadratic formula to find the remaining real zeros. So, so far from the last four steps, we found out that f of x is equal to x minus 1. That was one of the factors. And we found out the quotient polynomial using synthetic division. It was x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 8x squared minus 16x plus 16. But let's repeat the process with this new polynomial, which we'll call q of x because it was the quotient polynomial. So q of x will be x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 8x squared minus 16x plus 16. Let's repeat the remainder and factor theorems with this new polynomial q of x. So the first thing that we're going to do is find out if x equals 1 is a repeated 0. Maybe it has multiplicity 2. So let's substitute 1 into the quotient polynomial and find out what's the remainder if you take the quotient polynomial q of x and divide by x minus 1 again. So if you substitute in 1, you'll have 1 to the 4th minus 4 times 1 cubed plus 8 times 1 squared minus 16 times 1 plus 16. That turns out to be 5. So the remainder is 5 whenever you divide q of x by x minus 1. And so, in other words, x minus 1 is not a repeated factor of f of x.
So the x minus 1 will be to the first power as a factor. So let's go to the next possibility. We knew that we had possibilities of rational zeros as positive 1, positive 2, positive 4, positive 8, or positive 16. So the next rational zero to try is 2. So let's plug in 2 into the polynomial function q of x to find out what's the remainder when you take q of x and divide by x subtract 2. So if you plug in 2, you'll have 2 to the 4th minus 4 times 2 cubed plus 8 times 2 squared minus 16 times 2 plus 16. That does come out to be 0. The remainder is 0 when you take q of x and divide by x minus 2. So we found out another factor of the polynomial f of x. We know that f of x had a factor of x minus 1, and now we also found out another factor, it's x minus 2. So let's find out what is the new quotient polynomial. So let's take q of x and divide by x minus 2 using synthetic division to find out what is the new quotient polynomial. So if you take synthetic division, the coefficients of q of x go on the inside. So you have 1, negative 4, 8, negative 16, and positive 16. 2 goes on the outside because we're taking q of x and divide by x subtract 2. So now use synthetic division again. Drop down the leading coefficient 1 and now multiply. 2 times 1 gives you 2. 2 goes underneath the negative 4 and now you add vertically. Negative 4 plus 2 gives you negative 2. 2 times negative 2 will give you negative 4. 8 plus negative 4 will give you positive 4. 2 times 4 will give you 8. So 8 goes underneath the negative 16. And then you add vertically. Negative 16 plus 8 gives you negative 8. 2 times negative 8 gives you negative 16, and then the last column is 16 minus 16 is 0. Well, we already knew the remainder was 0 because we plugged in 2 into the quotient polynomial and we got 0. So that meant if we took q of x and divide by x minus 2, we knew the remainder was going to be 0. So that means we know that q of x will factor as x minus 2 times this new quotient polynomial after synthetic division. It turns out to be 1x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 8. And so now, Notice that you have q of x is x minus 2 times this other new factor, x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 8. We'll call that a new quotient polynomial. And now you can either repeat the process again with this x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 8, or you can notice that you can factor this. It has four terms, and so you can use factor by grouping. So factor by grouping works this way. You have four terms. So you group the first two. So you take the first two terms, x cubed minus 2x squared, and you group them together in parentheses. And you take the last two terms, 4x minus 8, and you group those in parentheses. And now you factor out from each group the greatest common factor of each term in that group. So what's in common between x cubed and 2x squared? Well, an x squared. So you factor out x squared from that first group, and what's left over will be an x subtract 2. Now do the same thing with the other group. You have 4x minus 8. What's in common between 4x and negative 8? It's 4, so you factor out a 4 from the second group, and what's left over will be an x subtract 2 again. So now notice, you have x minus 2 left over from the first group, and you also have an x minus 2 left over from the second group. That means you have x minus 2 in common from both groups now. So the x minus 2 can be factored out from both terms. So you have an x minus 2 already on the outside, but now you have an x minus 2 that's in common that can be factored out. And then you have an x squared, and you have a plus 4 left over after you factor out the x minus 2 factor. And so now we have actually q of x completely factored. It's x minus 2 times x minus 2. That's x minus 2 all squared. And then this last factor is x squared plus 4. That doesn't factor any further. It's a sum of two squares. It's x squared plus 2 squared, which would give you 4. So that does not factor any further. So we can stop with x squared plus 4. And we also have x minus 2 all squared, and that turns out to be q of x. Well, we knew earlier that f of x was x minus 1 times what we were calling q of x. So now we can actually factor f of x completely. f of x is actually equal to x subtract 1 times this polynomial, x to the 4th minus 4x cubed plus 8x squared minus 16x plus 16. Well, we factored that polynomial as x minus 2 all squared times x squared plus 4. So f of x is x minus 1 times x minus 2 all squared and then times the factor x squared plus 4. This is the factored form of this polynomial function f of x. And so now if you want to find out what are the real zeros of this polynomial function f of x, you set the entire polynomial function equal to 0 and that means you have a product that's equal to 0. That means at least one of the factors must be 0. So x minus 1 equals 0 will give you a real 0 of x equals 1, and its multiplicity is 1 because the power on the factor x minus 1 is 1.
x minus 2 all squared could be 0, which means that x minus 2 equals 0. Well, that will give you a real 0 of x equals 2. And its multiplicity is 2 because x minus 2 was all squared in the factorization of f of x. And the x squared plus 4 doesn't factor any further over the real numbers. So it does not give us any real zeros. So the only real zeros we had were x equals 1 and x equals 2. So this finishes our video on finding the real zeros of polynomial functions using Descartes rule signs to determine the number of positive real zeros and also the number of possible negative real zeros of a polynomial function. And then we also found the real zeros of a polynomial function to write the function in its factored form. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about complex zeros and the fundamental theorem of algebra.